So the next talk will be about embedded uh, system security and Pascal, the speaker, will explain how you can hijack debug components for embedded security in ARM processors. Pascal is not only a uh, embedded uh, software security engineer but also a researcher in his spare time. So please give a very, very warm, welcoming, good morning applause to Pascal. Okay, uh, thanks for the introduction. So, as it was said, uh, I'm an engineer by day in, my, in a French company. So I work as an embedded uh, system security engineer. But this talk is mainly about my spare time uh, activity, which is a researcher, hacker, or whatever you call it. Uh, this is because uh, this talk I worked with a, a PhD student called Muhammad Abdul Wahab. And he was, uh, he is, sorry, a third year PhD student uh, in, in the French lab. So this talk will be mainly a representation on this work about uh, the embedded system security and especially the debug components uh, available in, uh, in our poster. Uh, don't worry about the link. Uh, at the end, there will be also the link with all the slides, uh, documentations, and everything. So, uh, yeah, I, before the, uh, the Congress, I didn't know about uh, what kind of background did you need for, for my talk. So, I put there some links, uh, I mean some references of some talks where we, you will have all the vocabulary needed uh, for, to understand at least uh, some parts of my talk. So, yeah, about the computer architecture and the embedded system security, I hope you had uh, attended the talk by Alistair about uh, the formal uh, verification of software and also uh, the talk by Keegan about uh, trusted execution environments, so uh, VTE, such as Trezol. And uh, in this talk, I will also uh, talk about uh, FPGA stuff uh, and about FPGAs. So there was a talk on day two about FPGA reverse engineering. And if you don't know about FPGAs, I hope that you have some time uh, to go to the OpenFPGA assembly because uh, these guys are doing a great job about FPGA uh, open source tools. So yeah, when you see this, uh, this slide, I mean, uh, the first question is that uh, why I put uh, uh, Trozon is not enough. Uh, just a quick reminder about what is Trozon. Uh, Trozon is about uh, separating a system between a non-secure world uh, in red and the secure world uh, um, in, in green. So uh, when we want to use uh, the, uh, the Trozon framework, we have lots of hardware components, lots of software components, and allowing us to, let's say, to run separately uh, a secure uh, OS and a non-secure OS. Uh, in our case, what we wanted to do is to use the debug components, you can see it uh, on the left side uh, of the picture, to, uh, to see if we can uh, make some security with it. And furthermore, uh, we, uh, we wanted to use something else that, than Trezon because uh, if you attended the talk about uh, the security uh, in uh, the Nintendo Switch, you can see that the Trezon framework can be, uh, let's say, bypassed under uh, specific uh, cases. Uh, furthermore, uh, this talk is something uh, quite complementary because we will do uh, something uh, at a low level, I mean at a low level, at the processor architecture level. So I will uh, talk uh, in a later part of my talk about what uh, we can do between Trezon and uh, the approach uh, developed in this work. So basically the presentation will be uh, a quick uh, introduction. Uh, I will talk about some works uh, aiming to use deb debug components uh, to make some security. Then I will talk about uh, Armex, uh, which is the, uh, the name of the system we developed uh, to use the debug components uh, in Harper Store. And finally some results and the conclusion. So, uh, yeah, in the context of our project, uh, we, were, uh, we were working with uh, system on chips. So, system on chips are, a kind, are this kind of device where we have uh, in the green part a processor, so it can be uh, a single core, a dual core, or even a quad core processor. 
And um, another interesting part, which is in yellow uh, in the image here, is the programmable logic, which is also called an FPGA in this case. And uh, in this kind of uh, system on chip, you have uh, the hardcore processor, the FPGA, and some links uh, between those two, uh, those two units. And so you can see here in the little uh, red, uh, uh, red rectangle, sorry, uh, one of the two processor. So yeah, uh, this picture is uh, an image of, uh, of a system of chip called Zinc, provided by Xinix, which is also an uh, FPGA provider. And this kind of chip, we usually have uh, two Cortex-A9 processors and some FPGA logic uh, to, uh, to work with. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so what we want to do with the debug components is to work about dynamic information flow tracking. So basically, what is information flow? Uh, information flow is the transfer of information from an, uh, an information container C1 to C2 in a given process P. So, uh, in other words, if we take uh, this simple code over there, if we have uh, four variables, for instance, A, B, W, and X, uh, the idea is that, uh, okay, if you have some uh, metadata in A, the metadata will be transmitted to W. Uh, in other words, uh, what, uh, what kind of information we will, uh, will we uh, transmit uh, into the code? Well, basically, uh, the information I'm talking in the, uh, in the first block is, okay, this data is private, this data is public, and we should not mix uh, data which are public and private together. So uh, basically, we can say that uh, the information can be a binary information which is public or private, but of course, we will be able to have uh, several levels of, uh, of information. Uh, in the following parts, uh, this information will be called uh, taint or even tags. And uh, to be, uh, let's say, to be uh, a bit more simple, uh, we will use some colors to say, okay, my tag is red or green, just to say if it's uh, private or public data. So yeah, um, so as I said, uh, if, if the, uh, the tag contained uh, in A is, uh, is red, the data contained in W will be red as well. And the uh, same thing for, for BNX. Uh, if we take a, a quick example over there, so if we look at um, a buffer overflow, so uh, in the upper side of the slide you have uh, you have the, uh, the assembly code, and uh, on the lower part, uh, the green column will be uh, the color of the tags, and uh, on, the, uh, on the right side of these columns, uh, you have uh, the status of the different registers. So uh, this code is basically, okay, uh, when my input is read at the beginning, so basically we just, we just use the tainted input uh, into the index variable, so basically, uh, the register two, which contains uh, the IDX variable, will be uh, read as well. And then, when we want to access a buffer, a buffer IDX, which is the second line in the, uh, in the, in the C code at the beginning, basically the, the information uh, have there will be uh, read as well. And of course, uh, the result uh, of, the, of the operation, which is X, uh, will be read as well. So basically that means that uh, if there is a tainted input at the beginning, we, can, we must be able to transmit uh, the, uh, this information until the return address uh, of this code. Just to say, okay, uh, if this tainted input is private, uh, the return address at the end of, uh, of the code uh, should, be, should be private as well. Uh, what, what can we do with that? Uh, there is a simple code over there, so this is a simple code saying, okay, uh, if you are a normal user, if you code in your code, you would just have to, uh, to open the, um, the, the welcome file. Otherwise, if you're a, a root user, you must, uh, you must open the password file. So this is basically to say, okay, uh, if we want to open the welcome file, this is a public information, you can do whatever you want with it. Otherwise, if it's, a root, uh, if it's a root user, maybe the password will contain, for instance, a cryptographic key, and we should not go to the printf, uh, to the printf uh, function at the end, uh, at the end of, the, of this code. So basically, uh, the idea behind that is to check that, 
the the FS variable containing the the data of the of the file is private or public. So uh, there are mainly three steps for that. Uh, first of all, the compilation will give us uh, the assembly code. Uh, then. We should modify, well, we must modify uh, the system calls to, uh, to send uh, the tags. So the tags will be, as I said before, the private or public information about, uh, about my uh, FS variable. And uh, I will talk a bit about that later, but uh, maybe in future works, uh, the idea is to make or at least to compile an operating system uh, integrated uh, uh, with integrated support, sorry, for, for the IFT. So, uh, yes, yeah, so there were already some works about uh, dynamic information flow tracking. So basically, uh, we should do uh, this kind of information flow tracking in two manners. So the first one at the application level, so uh, basically working at the uh, Java on Android, uh, Android level. Uh, some works also, uh, also propose some solutions at the OS level, for instance, uh, Kblayer. But what we wanted to do here is to work at a lower level, so this is not at the application at the OS level, but just at the, uh, at, more at the hardware level, or at least at the, project, uh, sorry, at the uh, processor architecture level. So uh, if you want to have some information about uh, the, uh, the OS level implementation of information flow tracking, you can go to blair-ids.org uh, where you have some implementations of, the, uh, of an Android port and a Java port of, uh, of uh, intrusion, intrusion detection systems. So yeah, uh, in the rest of my talk, I will just uh, go through the, the existing works and just see what we can do about that. Um, when we talk about uh, dynamic information flow tracking for, uh, uh, at the low level, there are mainly uh, three approaches. The first one is uh, we, uh, the one in the, in the left side of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the slide, sorry. So basically, uh, the idea is to say, okay, uh, in, the, uh, in the upper side of this figure, we have the normal processor pipeline, so basically a decode stage, uh, a register file, and uh, an arithmetic and logic unit. And um, the basic idea is to say, okay, uh, when we want to uh, process with tags or taints, we just duplicate uh, the processor pipeline, so basically with the, with the gray uh, pipeline uh, under, under the normal one, just to uh, process data. And it implies two things. First of all, we must have the source code of the processor itself just to duplicate uh, the processor pipeline and to make, and, uh, the, let's say, the DIFT uh, pipeline, uh, pipeline. So this is uh, quite, uh, quite, uh, quite an inconvenience because we must, have, uh, we must have the source code of the processor, which is not uh, really easy sometimes. And um, the... Otherwise, the, let's say the main advantage of this approach is that, okay, we can do nearly anything we want because we have access to all codes. So we can uh, pull all wires we need from the processor just to get the information we need. Uh, uh, yeah, on the second approach, so this is the right side of the picture, there is something a bit more different. So instead of having a single processor aiming to do uh, the normal application flow plus the information flow tracking. We should separate uh, the, uh, the, the normal execution and the, uh, the information flow tracking. So this is the second approach over here. And this approach is not satisfying as well because you will have uh, one core running the normal application. That's okay. But uh, the uh, so core number two in the figure over there will be just uh, able to make the IFT control. So basically, it's, it's a bit of shame just to use the processor just to make some uh, DFT controls. So uh, let's say the best compromise we can do is to make a dedicated coprocessor just to make the uh, information flow tracking uh, processing. So basically, uh, the, the most interesting word in this topic is to have a main core processor aiming to just to make the, the normal application and a dedicated core processor just to make the IFT controls and you will have some communications between uh, those two cores. So yeah, basically if we want to make a quick comparison between uh, different works. 
So if you want to run uh, the uh, dynamic information flow for control, sorry, in pure software, I will talk about that just uh, in the in the slide after. But this is uh, really, uh, really, uh, I mean really painful in terms of, ta of time read because you will see that uh, the time to do uh, information flow tracking in pure software is really unacceptable. And regarding the hardware assisted approach, uh, the best advantage in all cases is that we have a lower overhead in terms of, uh, of silicon era. That means that on this slide, um, the, uh, the overhead between the main core and the main core plus the core is not is not so important. And we will see that uh, in uh, in the case of Matok, we will see that uh, the dedicated uh, DFT core is also uh, is also um, let's say is also uh, easier to uh, to uh, to get some uh, different security policies. Uh, so yeah, as I said, in uh, in the pure software solution, so the first line of, of this table, the the basic idea behind that is to use uh, instrumentation. So if you're up there on day two, uh, instrumentation is basically the transformation of a program into its own measurement tool. So basically, that means that we will put uh, some sensors in all parts of my code uh, just to uh, just to monitor this activity and uh, gather for some information from it. So basically, if we want to measure the impact of instrumentation on the execution time of an application, uh, you can see in this diagram over there uh, the normal application uh, level which is normalized uh, to one and when we want to use instrumentation with it um, the minimal overhead we will have is about 75% uh, so basically uh, it will uh, the, let's say the time with instrumentation will be most of the time it will be uh, twice higher than the normal uh, execution time so this is completely unacceptable because it will just run slower your, your application so basically, yeah, as I said, uh, the, main, uh, the main concern about my talk is about reducing the overhead of software implementation. Uh, I will talk also a bit about the security of the DFT coprocessor because we can't, uh, we can't include a DFT coprocessor without uh, taking care of its security. And uh, this is, uh, according to my, to my knowledge, this is the first work about uh, DFT in a harm-based uh, system on chips. Uh, on, the, on the talk about uh, the security of the Nintendo Switch, uh, the speaker said that black bus texting is that, except that it isn't. Uh, in our case, uh, we have, um, we have uh, only a black box because we can't modify the structure of the processor. We must uh, make uh, our job without, uh, let's say, decapping the processor and so on. So basically, uh, this is an overall uh, schematic of our architecture. So on the left side, uh, with, uh, in light green, you have uh, the ARM processor. So basically, in this case, this is a simplified version with only one core. And on the right side, uh, you have the structure of the, uh, of the core processor we implemented uh, in the FPGA. So basically, you can notice, uh, for instance, uh, for, for the moment, sorry, uh, two things. The first is that uh, you have some links between the, the FPGA and the CPU. Uh, these links are already, pre are already existing uh, in, in the system of chip. And you can see another thing is that uh, uh, regarding the memory, you have separate memory for the, uh, for the processor and for the FPGA. And we will see later that we can use Trust Zone in the concept just to add the layer of security, just to be sure that uh, we won't, we won't uh, let's say, mix the memory between the CPU and, and the FPGA. So basically, when we want to work with ARM, uh, with ARM processor, we must use uh, ARM data sheets. We must read ARM data sheets. And first of all, uh, don't be afraid by the length of ARM data sheets. Because uh, in my case, I used to work with the ARM v7 uh, technical manual, which is already uh, 2,000 pages. Uh, the ARM v8 uh, manual is about 6,000 pages anyway. Um, and of, of course, uh, what is also difficult is that the information is uh, split between different documents. 
Anyway, uh, when we want uh, to use the debug components, uh, in the case of ARM, we just have uh, this register over there, which is called uh, DBG blah blah blah. So we can see that uh, in this uh, register, we can say that, okay, writing the key value uh, 0, C5, A, blah 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 to this will lock the debug register. And if you write any other value, it will uh, just uh, unlock those debug registers. So that was basically uh, the first step uh, to. Um, to, uh, to enable the debug components was just to, uh, to write uh, a random value to, uh, to, this register, uh, to this register just to unlock uh, my, uh, my debug components. So uh, here is again the, um, uh, let's say, a schematic of the overall system and chip. So as you can see, you, you have, the, let's say, the tripressor and on the top part, you have uh, what are called the core set components. So these are the famous uh, debug components I will talk about in the second part of my talk. So here is a simplified view of uh, the debug components we have uh, in, uh, uh, in Zinc SOCs. So basically, uh, on, the left, on the left side, we have uh, the two processors, so the CPU0 and CPU1. Uh, and all the core side components are PTM, so the one uh, which is the, in the red rectangle, and also the ECT, which is the embedded cross uh, trigger, and the ITM, which is the instrumentation uh, trace microcell. And basically, when we want to, uh, let's say, extract some data from these core side components, uh, the, basic, uh, the basic path will be, okay, we use uh, the PTM, and we will follow the red line, go through the funnel, and at this step we'll have two choices to store uh, the information taken uh, from, uh, from debug components. The first one is the embedded trace buffer, which is uh, a small memory embedded in the processor. Unfortunately, this uh, memory is really uh, low because uh, it's really small, sorry, because it's only about uh, four kilobytes as far as I remember. But the other uh, possibility is just to export some data to the uh, trace packet output. And this is what we will use just to uh, export some data to the, uh, to the processor, uh, to the coprocessor, sorry, implementing in the NVFPGA. So basically, uh, what PTM is able to do, uh, the first thing uh, that PTM can do is to trace uh, whatever, you could, whatever you want in, in your memory. For instance, you can trace all your code, so basically all the blue, all the blue sections, but you can also, um, you, you can also uh, let's say, trace a specific region uh, of the code. So basically, that means that you can say, okay, I just want to trace the code in my section one, on, say, or section two, or section N. Uh, then the PTM is also able to make some branch broadcasting. Uh, that is something that was not present in the Linux kernel, so we already submitted a patch uh, that was accepted uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to manage the branch broadcasting uh, into the PTM. And we can do some uh, time, st time stamping and other things just to be uh, able to, uh, to store the information in, in the traces. So basically, what a trace is, uh, what a trace looks like. So uh, here is the most simple code we could add. It's just a for loop uh, doing nothing. So basically, the assembly code over there, and the trace will look like this. So uh, in the in the first, uh, let's say in the first uh, five bytes, we'll have. Uh, some, some kind of start packet, which is called the async packet, just to say, okay, this is the beginning of the trace. Uh, in the green part, we will have uh, the address which corresponds to the, to, uh, to the beginning of the loop. And uh, in the orange part, we will have uh, the uh, branch address packet. So you can see that you have uh, 10 iterations of this branch address packet because we have 10 iterations uh, of the for loop. So this is just to show what is the general structure of, uh, of, uh, uh, of a trace. Uh, yeah, uh, so in other words, this is just a control forgot just to say uh, what we could have about this. So of course, if we have a novel loop at the end of this control forgot, it will just uh, make the trace a bit longer just to have the, the information about the, about the second loop and so on. 
uh, once we have uh, all these uh, traces, uh, the next step is to say, okay, I have my tags, but now how, how do I, uh, let's say, define the rules between, uh, between an institution and another just to transmit my tags? And this is where we will use uh, static analysis for this. So basically, in, the, in this example, if we have uh, the instruction, okay, uh, just do uh, help uh, register one plus register two and put the, uh, the result in uh, register zero. So for this we will use uh, static analysis which allows us to say okay the tag uh, the tag associated with register zero will be the tag of register one or the tag of uh, or register two. And a static analysis will be done uh, before running my code just to say okay I have all the rules uh, needed uh, for all the lines uh, of my code. So now that we have the traces, we know how to transmit uh, the, um, the tags uh, all over my code. The final step uh, will be just to make uh, the static analysis in the, uh, in the LLVM uh, backend. And the final step will be about instrumentation. So as I said before, we can, uh, we can recover all the memory addresses we need through instrumentation. Otherwise, we can also, uh, in, the, in the second possibility, we can also only uh, let's say get the register related memory addresses for instrumentation. Uh, in the first case, on this uh, simple code, uh, we, uh, we can basically just, uh, just say, okay, we instrument all the code, but the main, uh, the main drawback of this solution is that, okay, we, it will completely, uh, um, it will completely excess the, the, the time of, uh, of the execution. Otherwise, what we can do is that, okay, uh, we've, uh, with the stone section over there, we can get uh, data from the trace. So basically, we will use the program control address from the trace. And then for the stack pointer, we will use the static analysis to get information from the stack pointer. And finally, we can use only one uh, insurmonted, insurmonted so instruction at the end. So if I go back to this, uh, to this system, uh, yeah, uh, the communication overhead will be uh, the main, uh, let's say, the main drawback, uh, as I said before. Because, okay, uh, if we have over there the processor and the FPGA uh, running in, in, uh, in different parts, the main, let's say, problem will be how we can transmit data in real time or at most, uh, at least in, uh, in, in, in the higher speed we can between the processor and the FPGA. So yeah, uh, the PTM, uh, so this is the, uh, the, let's say the time of red when we enable the cross components or not. So basically in blue we have uh, the, the, the time of red, uh, let's say the basic time of red when the traces are disabled. And we can see that when we, when we enable traces, uh, the time of red is nearly, uh, is nearly negligible. Um, yeah. Uh, regarding time instrumentation, we can see that uh, regarding the strategy two, which is uh, you are using the, the, the concept components using the uh, static analysis and the instrumentation, we can lower the, the instrumentation overhead from 53% up down to uh, 5%. So this is basically, okay, we still have some uh, overhead due to instrumentation, but it's really low compared to the related works where all the code was uh, instrumented. And this is an overview uh, that, uh, that shows us that uh, in the gray lines you have some, uh, some overheads of uh, related works with uh, full instrumentation. And we can see that uh, in our approach with the green, uh, the green lines over there, uh, that uh, the overhead, the time overhead with, uh, with our code is much, much slower, uh, smaller, sorry. So yeah, so basically uh, 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 how we can use, uh, how Trezon is this. So this is just an overview of our system. And we can say, okay, we can use Trezon just to separate uh, the CPU from the, uh, from the FPGA coprocessor. So if we make uh, a comparison uh, between uh, with uh, related works, we can see that uh, compared to the first works, we are able to make some information for control with uh, an hard compressor, which, is, which was not the case with, uh, with the two first works uh, in this table. So it means that, okay, you can use a basic hard processor just to make the information for tracking instead of having a, a specific processor. 
And of course, uh, yeah, the area overhead, which is another important topic, is much, much slower compared to the extending growth. So it's time for the conclusion. So yeah, as I presented in this talk, we are able to use uh, the PTM component just to um, obtain uh, runtime information about my application. Uh, this is a non-intrusive tracing because uh, we still have a negligible performance overhead. Uh, and we also improved the software security just because we were able to make some security uh, on the coprocessor. So the future perspective about that is to mainly to work with a multi-core processor and to see if we can use uh, the same approach for uh, Intel and maybe uh, ST microcontrollers to see if we can also do uh, information flow tracking in this case. So that was basically for my talks. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much for this talk. Unfortunately, we don't have time for Q&A, so um, please, if you leave the room, um, take your trash with you and make the angels happy. Oh, I was again. a bit long, yeah. Huh? I was a bit long in my talk. Yeah. <laughs> and another round of applause for Pascal.